Please remember this presentation includes preliminary data that are unpublished and should not be viewed as scientific publication from Archbold. Thank you all for joining us. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Eric Mangus, Archbold's Director of Plant Ecology. Welcome everybody to this intern seminar. I'm really pleased to present Seth Rayner. Um, Seth's a really uh, a wonderful, bright young man and he, uh, he comes to us from North Carolina State University where he got uh, two bachelor's of science degrees in environmental science and in plant biology with a really outstanding GPA. He also has a considerable research experience working um, in Brazil uh, in a Cerrado, uh, working with uh, Bill Hoffman's group that does a lot of interesting fire ecology. Um, his application uh, and his interview didn't give much indication of his direction, but when he got to Archbold, he became uh, instantly fascinated with ground lichens and has done a really interesting project and also uh, really helped out our ground lichen, our lichen collection in the herbarium. So it's my pleasure to welcome Seth Rayner, who's going to talk about the path to enlightenment. Thank you, Eric. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today. My name is Seth Rayner, and today I invite you all to join me on the path to enlightenment. Today, we will give an overview of lichen to begin before jumping into discussing lichen at the station. During that, we'll talk about the diversity that's found here, as well as the journey to create a new species list for Archbold. Then we will give an overview of the genus Cladonia before going into the main topic of today, which is my independent project on looking at correlations between biodiversity and microhabitat with Cladonia presence and cover. At the end, like was said, we will have a Q&A and I'll be able to answer any questions you have. Lichen are fairly misunderstood and understudied compared to most species that are found here at the station. In fact, if you Google the definition of a lichen, it will tell you it's a slow growing plant. And in fact, we know that is not the case. Uh, lichens are composite organisms made up of multiple species. Primarily, they're made up of a fungal partner and a photosynthetic partner. That photosynthetic partner can take the form of an algae or cyanobacteria, though there have been multiple cases of both being found in the same lichen. There's also been cases where a second fungal partner has been found that takes the form of a yeast, and they believe that helps with the structure. And many studies lately have been looking at the bacterial community found within lichen and the viruses that attack them. Lichen have a variety of forms, and these form names can get confusing and misconstrued, but if they're explained well, I believe anyone can understand them. I've listed the three main ones that are talked about, fruticose, foliose, and crustose. Fruticose, you can just think of a piece of fruit, a banana or an orange. It's a three-dimensional object, so this fruticose lichen will be three-dimensional. The, the other two, foliose and crustose, are two-dimensional. And the difference between them, you can tease out with the name foliose, you can think of leaf. And just how a leaf has two sides, a foliose lichen, you can get to both the upper and lower side, where a crustose lichen is too adnate or too close to the surface that's growing on for you to actually get under it. There are multiple pathways of reproduction, both vegetative and sexual. They're very slow growing species, which means they usually have negative impacts due to disturbance, including fire. And they have many ecological impacts outside of just being um, contributors to the biodiversity. They can photosynthesize, they can fix nitrogen if they do have that cyanobacteria. They become survival food in the winter when there's less vegetation for herbivores to eat. And they can tolerate desiccation and other harsh environments. Every lichenologist I've spoken to has made it clear to me how special Archbold is. In general, but specifically for lichens, there's a decent history of lichen studying here. The first group that I found to study lichen were Bassett and Homola in 1985. They set out to make the first species list of the station that I could find. They found 49 species. And when I've discovered this, I decided to set out on my own path to set up my own list. To do this, I needed help with 
getting collections from other herbaria that have been collected here. And I also needed help determining certain identifications and the Lycan community helped me greatly with that. Anyone I emailed was always more than willing to help and it definitely made this process a lot easier. So using our collections, collections from other lichenologists and collections from other universities, we now know that there's 178 species that have been identified to be here at the station. I've included the numbers for genera, family, and orders as well to emphasize that these aren't just species additions due to splitting. These are entirely new groups that are being recognized to be here at the station. Looking closer at the genera, Cladonia is by far the most diverse, followed by Parmatrima, Romulina, and Usnia, which had multiple that were tied with it as six species. I want to really focus in on the Cladonia. They were the first lichens I ever learned. They're the most conspicuous, in my opinion, at least in the scrub habitat. And their diversity and variety make them impossible not to be interested in as soon as you start learning. They're a dimorphic genus, which means they have two phases of growth. They have a primary and a secondary. Their primary is a squamulose phase, which is an in-between between a fruticose and foliose thallus. So when I said earlier, fruticose was three-dimensional and foliose was two-dimensional, squamulose is like small lobes. And at the naked eye, they may look flat, but under a microscope, they do have depth and there's plenty of variation between them. You can see in the pictures, the Cladonia evansii, preferata, and leparina are all showing only their secondary thalli, their fruticose stage, while the picture in the upper left, the Cladonia subradiata, is showing both its fruticose stage, which are the finger-like structures, and then at the bottom, if you look very closely, there are small lobed structures, which are the squamals. Cladonia have both epiphytic and vagrant species here at the station. The epiphytic ones love the palm rhizomes, while the vagrant species do not attach to any substrate and can be wind dispersed through the scrub. This helps with their movement and their multiple pathways of reproduction, like I talked about earlier, helps them propagate throughout the landscape. In the scrub, they're eliminated by fire have slow increase in abundance across post-fire time in both gaps and matrix, and don't show any signs of allelopathy, but do seem to inhibit germination by preventing seeds from reaching the mineral soil. Because Cladonia had so much going on with it, there were endless possibilities, and I had tons of goals and tons of questions, but today I will be focusing on two main objectives I had. First was to understand how factors of biodiversity affect presence and cover of Cladonia ground lichen at Archbold. And second was to determine if the fire regime or microhabitat factors impact the presence or cover of Cladonia more. To do this, we used line intercept sam sampling. We randomly created points. We created random points that were stratified by time since fire and fire severity. I sampled 120 of them. At each point, I took four radial one meter transects, all facing in the four cardinal directions. You can see in the upper right, I have a model of what this would look like with the blue dot representing the center of the plot and the straight yellow lines representing my four transects. Along those transects for each centimeter, I noted which was the dominant ground cover directly under the transect, whether that was bare sand, lichen, litter, subshrub vegetation, or woody debris. And as you can see in the model, there's things that don't get picked up by the transects, but since it's an average among the whole plot, it's okay that it misses a few. Some microhabitat data was collected while other was brought in from ABS's records. The distance to water, elevation, and fire history were all well documented here at Archbold, so they were easy to bring into the data, while the densiometer measurements and dominant vegetation had to be noted while I was there. To analyze this, we used a binary logistic regression and a general linear model. And in the center, 
you can see the distribution of all my plots throughout Archbold. First thing I'd like to talk about before jumping into the two analyses I just talked about is severity. To do the two, to do the re regression in the model, we had to meet certain assumptions. And one of those assumptions is to make sure that there was homogeneity. So we had to run tests to make sure those assumptions were met and for severity, they were not. Even if they were met, you can see in the highlighted two-tailed significance, they weren't even approaching significance. Though they weren't statistically significant, we can still look at trends. In the bar graph, you can see that there's a obvious negative towards lichen cover for high severity. And that's mainly due to the nature of what that severity three is. A severity three here is a complete burn which means there's no patches left for lichen to survive post fire. Because of this, there is no way for there to be any lichen abundance after the fire and they have to wait for a new lichen to establish there before they even start growth. Whereas the lower severities one and two may have some lichen that make it and can already have lichen there to begin growth after fire. Since, like I said, since there was too much variance in these lower severities, we had to exclude them from the regression in the model. But moving forward, to predict occurrence, we used our binary logistic regression to look for correlations between habitat factors, time since fire, and lichen presence. The habitat variables were non-significant, but the time since fire did have a significant difference of 0.2. And I'd like to bring your attention to the number beside the significant value. That is known as the odds ratio. And what that odds ratio is telling us is that an area burned more than 20 years ago has a 12.1 times greater chance of having lichen present. And because of my data, this isn't too far fetched. Out of the 120 plots that I sampled, only 14 did not have lichen. And out of those 14, 10 were burned within the last decade. Moving to the model, we used a general linear model to show significant relationships, um, look, to look for significant relationships between time since fire and microhabitat data again. And similar data once again popped up. The microhabitat was non-significant while the time since fire was since this time since fire was indeed significant, we decided to run Tukey's honest significant difference on it to look at differences between our groups. And this showed us that it takes a decade of growth between fires to develop a significant different amount of lichen. This is shown by there not being a significant difference between bins that are beside each other. To show this visually, there is a bar graph with the four time since fire groups at the bottom and lichen cover towards the left. As you can see, as time since fire increases, there's a higher probability for a large percentage of lichen cover. However, you will also notice that they're all, their lower ends are all approaching zero, showing that even with time to rejuvenate and grow, local extirpation can still be a major consequence in these areas. In summary, time since fire is the primary factor that regulates presence and cover. What places that were burned a long time ago have time to have new lichen establish. And if there's lichen already present there, they have a kickstart to keep growing more. The severity had too much variability to really look into it, but the trends do show that there is a high consequence of complete burns to lichens. There didn't seem to be any limits due to microhabitat for lichen in general, though these may affect the specific species that are present. And all in all, the main point of the project that I learned is maintaining these long unburned patches is critical for fire sensitive species. 
and to maximize species diversity, continuing to promote a prior diverse landscape is very important. Future for lichens at Archbold. It is always a good idea to continue growing the number of species and growing the collections for future researchers and to help understand the greatness that's going on here. We can look further at species specific responses like I was talking about earlier, seeing if microhabitat factors really affect them. We can also compare habitat responses, not looking at just rosemary scrub, also maybe at scrubby flatwoods. Early data and observations are showing a higher consequence to local extirpation from scrubby flatwoods. And I believe that may have something to do with the openness or lack thereof of there compared to the scrub. The other thing that can be done is looking into management practices. Archbold is a class act and does a great job. So just continuing to promote a prior diverse landscape like they already do. And then there's multiple prevention methods that can be looked into to help prevent lichen from being consumed so that area can have a starting lichen cover to start growing from once the fire's done. Those methods can include removal and reintroduction or applying things like blankets or foam that prevent fire from consuming the lichen. With that, I would like to acknowledge Richard Archbold. His legacy is still living on today and I'm very happy to have been a part of it and have worked here. I wanna thank the Plant Ecology Lab. Working with everyone and learning from everyone has been an incredible experience. And I don't think I've ever learned more from a group of individuals. I would like to thank Vivian Slaughter because without her, I don't know if I would have been able to do my biodiversity project at all. She was a huge help, especially with GIS. Uh, Joe Gentile for helping me with resources and helping me find really obscure things for my list that have been probably lost for decades. And the Archbold community for making this feel like home for the past nine months. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank the Lycan community. Jumping into a new study system head first was really daunting and definitely made me think twice, but I met a great group of people just by reaching out and they were always super helpful and were nothing but nice to me. So I would really like to thank everybody for all their help. Here are my resources. And with that, we can start questions. Thank you very much, Seth. Um, and we have a few questions here, so I'll start with them. The uh, first question is from Gail Schmidt. Uh, she says, I heard that chiodectonic acid is responsible for the pink in Baton Rouge lichen, and that the acid gives UV protection to the lichen. Your thoughts, please. Baton Rouge? Uh, the only thing that stripped me up is I'm not, I don't know common names very much. Is the Baton Rouge lichen, like um, the Christmas tree lichen maybe? Or is there a different red lichen? I'm not sure on that one. I haven't heard okay. of Baton Rouge lichen. Well, maybe Gail will get back to us and give us some more information on that through the either chat or writing another question. Uh, Madeline says, does the cyanobacteria contribute to that red appearance on some species? It does not. The cyanobacteria actually would make it appear darker. It would be a much darker color. Um, whereas the algae would keep it like a more green color. The red, the red is most likely one of the secondary metabolites, like one of the lichen acids that was just talked about by Gail. Um, there's just so many different ones. Okay, uh, Martia asked, um, "Are there any lichen species? Oops, where'd it go? Are there any lichen species effect in colonization after fire? In other words, does one species come up before, or is there any pattern of species composition with time since fire?" Right. Um, I'm. I didn't see any specific 
species responses to which one pops up first. I will say I believe the vagrant lichens, the ones that don't attach to a substrate, have a higher chance of getting of getting into a region that was burned first. And that's just because they have they can be wind blown into that area. They don't have to rely on one of their spores to make it over there and a new thallus to emerge. Okay. Uh, Malcolm Hodges says, I've been preaching no interior ignition uh, in sand hills with significant lichen cover here in Georgia to allow fire to skip areas, creating heterogeneity. Have you tried that at Archbold? Um, I think that might be a better question for you, but I will say from what I've seen, it does seem like Archbold does a really great job of creating very mosaic, patchy environment with their fire. Yeah, we've tried to uh, not burn areas with the federally endangered like in Cladonia perforata. Um, and it's sometimes difficult. Sometimes you end up burning areas that you don't want to. It's uh, We haven't tried the blanket technique you suggested. We just tried to use lichen patterns. So there's probably right. some ways we could approach that. Right. Betsy Rothenberg says, although you didn't find an effect of microhabitat variables on presence absences of Cladonia, do you think microhabitat might affect its growth rates? It could, um, depending depending on which microhabitat like it would be. I do think that in the scrub there isn't a ton of difference. The main difference would be if it's really shaded or if it's out in the open. I don't know if that would directly affect its growth rate or not though because it would give it more sunlight being out in the open, but it would also call it, cause it to dry out more quickly. And from what I've seen, the lichens are most happy when they aren't dried out. Yeah, and it's, a, it's a challenge to get growth rate from like these lichens that are just moving around with yeah. the wind. Uh, Becky yeah. Yar, when she was here, uh, did some very detailed work where she tethered lichens, then collected them and weighed them and then put them back out in the field. <laughs> it's, it's a really intense work. Yeah. So Jordan Huffman says, it's kind of a long question. Uh, if you have these data, would it be possible to look for a relationship between colonia reestablishment after a complete burn and distance from the edge of the burned area? Time to reestablish it might be associated with distance from source populations. Um, we would, to do that, we would have to also have the data of source populations. Like we would have to, we would have to not only know the area that's burned and make sure there's no lichen in there, but we would have to look at where the lichen is around it and then survey it to see when the lichen actually gets in. Like it would have to be much more fine scaled um, data than just going like years after and trying to assume when it came in and where it came in from. Okay, we have a question is on the chat here from Dylan Winkler. Why did you focus on rosemary scrub, by the way? I focused on rosemary scrub because of how conspicuous Cladonia are in that system. And kind of like what I was talking about but opposite for the scrubby flatwoods, the scrub is so open that it allows for the movement of these wind dispersed vagrant lichens. And because of that, they do seem to be much more present in the scrub than the scrubby flatwoods. Okay, uh, Mandy asked, how do you need to alter your methodology or enter your project to look more at fire intensity? I would have to have intensity data. I didn't have any intensity data. Um, unless she's talking about the severity part? Yeah, I think she is, yeah. Okay. Um, I would probably just need more points, just 
more data. Um, it's really hard to plan things out on a variable that's like a human made construct. So like the severity um, categories we made, those have to be decided upon. Um, it's not like we're using a temperature from a hobo or we're using years, time since fire, where those are like things that aren't decided upon. And I think having those multiple severities, especially with the middle severity, kind of makes it all a little funky. Okay, Laurel Kaminsky asks, was there, were there differences in Cladonia species survivability after fire? Did a non Cladonia survive better than Cladonia? For example, Chiodecton herpophallon. Um, as far as Cladonia go, it seems like if they get hit with fire, they're done. Um, it doesn't matter what the severity is. It doesn't matter um, which one. It just every place I've seen, if a fire's gone through, there's no more. There's no more lichen. Um, the fire actually has to go around it, and you'll see the litter underneath that's not scorched right with the lichen. So it's obvious the fire didn't touch it. Um, but I think that plays a big part of why the severity had so much variance, because even if it's a, a the lowest severity burn possible, if the fire touches the lichen, it's done for. So it all depends on where the patches are. Okay, uh, Dwayne Coulterman asked, for years people have talked about lichens as great indicators of environmental change. Does that apply to lichens at Archbold? Um, maybe even almost the lack thereof, the environmental change is due to disturbances of some kind. Um, the one that's often looked at is air quality disturbance and the pollutants that are put into the air. Lichen don't, don't have a high diversity in areas that don't have good air quality. Um, so the fact that we can come here and look at 178 different species really tells us that like this area has pretty decent air quality. And because of the great job Archbold's done with maintaining those patches of unburned landscape, um, there's just so much different type of habitat for the lichens to grow in. Okay, next question is from Becky. I hope that's Becky Yar, who studied lichens here years ago. Becky said, yay, great job, Seth. I have two questions. I ask one at a time. First, did your findings change your opinion on fire management at all? I definitely did. Before coming here, and fire ecology as a whole, not even management, before coming here, I really thought fire ecology was about the fire specialist, the species that like fire, like the heat or the smoke or something with the fire, the openness. Um, and I thought fire management was about promoting those species. And now my mindset's more on mosaic landscapes, pyrodiverse landscapes, trying to maintain these like safe havens for lichen to still persist. And then like doing a lichen ecology project on a study system that are fire sensitive definitely just changed my whole mindset about that. Okay, uh, boy, we have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna uh, and choose. Uh, um, apologies to anybody who I don't pick. Um, Nancy Bissett said, we introduced three lichen species on a mine site in about 1985 with three foot spacing along transects. I revisited the site almost 20 years later and the ground cover had a heavy component of lichens to species well mixed. Could dig up photos with time. So that's that's kind of a, that's a comment rather than a question. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, Talia Kouris asks, can you determine time since fire from lichen cover? No, there's too much variability. So when I showed, um, I'll go back to it just so I can talk about it. So back at this bar graph, you can like make assumptions 
uh, um, you can see that all of their lower ends approach zero. So if it's a low abundance area, a low lichen cover area, no, I don't think there's a way to try to figure out time since fire from that. But I do think if it's a high, a high lichen cover over 80%, you can probably determine it's been over two decades since a fire. Okay, um, we have um, Amy Favor, who's done research here also. She says, nice job. Do you have any sense of how far the vagrant lichen can disperse? You mentioned they can be moved by the wind. Also, any idea how long an individual lives if it isn't affected by fire? Those are both really awesome questions. Um, I do not know how far if there's been a study looking at distance being traveled by a single lichen, it has a lot to do with the bald size and the, um, the matrix, the, the structure of the matrix, because eventually it'll hit something and stop. So if the matrix is very windy with paths, it might be able to go further, but if it's dense, it, it's gonna, um, and what was that second part? Um, how, how long does an individual live if it isn't affected by fire? Um, I'm not sure on that one either. I'm not sure about individual lifespans. Pretty long. Um, they can just keep growing until they get too big to support themselves and then break under their own weight. And then both of the that's just two individuals now. They, it just broke into two things. So I haven't seen much case for them dying. I had a box of lichens sitting on my desk for six months and I squirted them with water and one of them started producing uh, reproductive structures. So they can survive a lot. And Betsy Rothwell just chatted that we probably had a lot of long distance lichen dispersal after Hurricane Irma. And, uh, I bet you know? so. I actually have not thought about her looking at it in the sense of hurricanes. That's super interesting. Yeah, I know that Becky Yar found like is in the panhandle are really strewn around. She's able to return them uh, from shrubs back uh, into this the bare sand substrate, and they continue to survive. That's super cool. Uh, Madeline asks, is fire the only threat to lichen, or did you notice any reduction in the numbers for certain areas you're observing that didn't have fire present? Um, other disturbance is bad for it too. Um, it seems like fire, and at least in this system at Archbold, fire and the time between the fires is what matters. Um, mechanical disturbance can be an issue, and but that's really, here at least, that's only an issue in the fire lanes. So a lichen ballast can be blown into the fire lane, and then they re-chop it up, make it um, safe for the next fire, and that lichen could get lost. But overall, the main impact does look to be fire. Okay, uh, Brent uh, Budak asks, are there any lichen species you've encountered endemic to rosemary scrub or other scrub habitats at Archibald? I don't just I don't think that I know of one that is only endemic to rosemary scrub. Um, we have our endangered species, Cladonia preferata. It's one of only two endangered lichen species in the entire United States. Um, but it has a relatively strange uh, distribution throughout Florida um, that has a few disjunct areas. So it's not necessarily a scrub endemic. There are a couple of the other Cladonias, like Sands Today, or there's even a weird Dimorphoclata hybrid that looks like a different species. And I'm just, I barely ever see them. So maybe they have a potential of being more rare than that endangered species, but I don't think enough is done with the lichen for them to be recognized. 
You up for two more questions, Seth, that are more applied? Yeah. Then we'll give you a break. Uh, Dwayne Coulterman asks, um, uh, points out that cloning perforata is one of the first lichens listed as endangered. And uh, he wants to know whether your studies revealed anything about its conservation status. It, it didn't, my, these studies that I presented here did not reveal anything about its conservation status. It does, a, it, it follows the same um, rules and patterns as the other lichens. They, the preferata was one of the lichens I found within my transect, so it wasn't so rare it didn't pop up in one of my random plots. Um, but it just goes back to the main point of conserving that mosaic landscape, pushing for pyrodiversity, and just trying to maintain those small safe havens for them to survive. Okay, and a related question comes from Nicole Pinson from uh, Hillsborough County, wanting to know if you have land management recommendations from your research regarding the best practices for preserving lichens. For example, uh, how often do you prescribe fire intervals in areas with lichens? Right. Um, I, would, I would suggest, I guess starting with the second part, then moving to the first, not, um, I would not plan fire intervals around lichen. I would either um, do what the one person said earlier, where they were avoiding the center of the patches and just trying to get the matrix with fire, or using prevention methods like um, removal and reintroduction which you have to be careful with because you have to make sure you're putting the bottom side down again or it's going to mess up its growth. Um, or those blankets or the foam, just something to protect it. That would be the only things I could think of management-wise that would increase it. But there are ways to protect the lichen while still implementing the fire regime to the land manager's wants without like messing that up. And I think that'll be a big factor in pushing forward to make people actually do these things. Okay, and uh, Scott just made a comment that FNA, Florida Natural Areas Inventory, is, is conducting field site visits now on Clodonia perforata uh, records. So that update will be helpful in sort of informing the conservation status of that species. So thank you very much, Seth. I want to thank everybody uh, watching on Facebook everybody watching uh, here. We had a really good crowd and great questions. And uh, um, have a great day. Thanks again, Seth. No problem. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Seth. That was very enlightening. <laughs> yes, I imagine you're all laughing right now. Thanks again to all our participants today on Zoom and Facebook. We really appreciate your attendance each week. If Seth did not answer your question today, watch out for a follow-up email with anything we missed. Please check out our website and Facebook pages for updates and to sign up for our June events, including virtual field trips, virtual summer camp for kids, and more Thursday seminars. And for our scientists in attendance, we always welcome visiting lecturers for seminar series. So if you're interested, please contact your point person at Archbold. Thanks again and see you soon. Bye everybody.